law is before the protests against the authoritative change. Um, and your translators will be Dimi, Lula, and Sebalis. So, um, you can give us feedback on Twitter using the hashtag C3T. So, so um, starting now, so um, there have been a lot of uh, very questionable uh, laws within the last years, uh, which, uh, yeah, if you if you sacrifice uh, your freedom for security, you will lose everything. Um, so we don't know. Uh, so now we have uh, Laura Pula and Johnny Parks. They are going to tell you about what we have to do now to stay free. Hi and welcome to our presentation um, about the new police laws. I'm um, part of the, well, uh, against the Ger group against the German police law. I'm Johnny. I'm also s from the beginning against so the well, collaboration against the Bavarian police um, laws. So, um, and when organizing the first big demonstration against the uh, German police law, we uh, get to know each other. There were f more than 50,000 people in Munich going onto the streets, which is a really big number for Munich. There hasn't been a big, such a big demo for decades in Munich. And in Bavaria, the data protection, uh, prote data protection. Um, people were very important uh, partners from the beginning onwards and that's why we want to talk to you uh, today because uh, the police laws this topic and the security safety laws and uh, increasing uh, so-called security and actually uh, yeah that's that's relevant for for us like which is the anti-fascist movement for Johnny, it's um, anti-racism and climate uh, catastrophe movement and also the movements that, m that meet here. Because for all our movements, this is something that is a huge threat to all of us. And we would like to talk uh, a short, uh, to give a short overview what we are going to do now. And Johnny will tell you sh uh, briefly what the Bavarian police uh, law actually is and why we are against it and how the protests against it went. I'll uh, then put this into a bigger society context to p ask the basic question, what is actual, what's actually happening there and why do we have this uh, development to more and more um, laws that uh, increase law enforcement's powers. Uh, and Johnny will give some shocking examples for that, um, what will happen and what will happen if those uh, laws increase in coming and there will be more and more of those. And finally, I'll uh, give some some advice how we may continue working to make uh, to to make our movement still possible. That has been very loud last year, and but uh, it's now like s bit slower. So I'll, I'll start. And so we call the the thing of the PAG, so P A G, which is the abbreviation of police uh, of the police law in Bavaria, uh, in uh, Bavaria. Yeah, so it's the law for the for what what the police has to do. Yeah, and I'll start chronologically. So in 2015, what none of us missed was the debate or the escalating debate uh, of about refugees coming to Europe that has been uh, th that has been led to. Uh, loss of control uh, for conservative power and police, at least that's what they felt. And the CSU in Bavaria actually felt that they are losing their power and so they want to restore that. And this is why they told us that they will have a political offensive against right-wing parties. Um, and then in 2016, this uh, feeling grew even more because you had the terrorist attack in Munich, in uh, shopping center, and another one uh, of the, well, Christmas market on Ber in Berlin. 
And then the CSU in Bavaria, so that's the conserver conservative party, and CSU is a conservative party in Bavaria. So they used um, the, this uh, act, this terrorist attack to achieve their aims because they had uh, the fear of the people on their side at that point. Um, and well, and so the the law for integration. Um, is for how so-called or like supposed foreigners have to um, behave, and so you w they actually wanted to to write into law how people have to uh, behave uh, if they seem to be foreign, and then we had the first novel uh, of the police law, and uh, which is about so-called gefährdas, which means like uh, threatening people. So um, bis until now, you need a, a concrete danger uh, to to start investigations into things. But now things start. So this is in 2017. So it's not enough that you have a concrete danger, but just um, the well, rather vague assumption that there may be a, a danger coming up. Um, it's just if you if it's if you are, if you may be dangerous. Um, that's that's now added to when they can start to uh, the, when they are able to start an investigation just of, on those very vague grounds, and that's when it started that also lawyers started to listen to this and look into this law and criticize it because they said yeah that's a very vague term you can't use it that way. Um, this this law also enabled the police to make to to put people into a preventative uh, well arrest and actually this can be uh, um, you can be put for three months into jail and f then a judge can even extend this uh, arrest for three months forever so they can every three months they can prolong it so actually you can be j in jail forever without ever doing anything um, you also have you are not allowed to contact people you're not allowed to be in certain places all of these were powers uh, given to the police in 2018 uh, the second reform for this uh, law was uh, made um, so now I'll give a, an overview again no that's the wrong direction okay uh, so now so so police have more powers more uh, tools, more things, and before something actually hap happened, and you have less power to uh, defend yourself against those things by law. The no thing is, you have you have to report regularly to a police station. Um, you're forced to uh, give your identity away and to, uh, so to present your identity to prove who you are, uh, to go to jail if the, if the police wants it. Um, and of course the police is allowed to decide. Um, without a judge, uh, they can do, the police can do this and uh, they can also walk into a people's without a judge's uh, warrant and without uh, the consent of the people they can go into uh, flats and houses um, so it's possible to electronically surveil your home um, you can use uh, secret so undercover police officers uh, you can do online um, searches and uh, seizures. And so these, these are just some examples what the police is now able to do without a warrant. Uh, and as the police uh, acts racist in many cases and many people that are affected are refugees, uh, so from the start that is actually we can see a very racist uh, intention and so that's why we had a lot of protests against this um, and this led to a mass movement again for, for Bavarian uh, uh, cons Bavarian uh, reason in Bavaria that was a mass movement so and there were several groups moving together so for example who was part uh, the German uh, okay, so German uh, weed group, um, several uh, trade unions, anti-fascist groups, refugee welcomes, refugee uh, groups, um, young students and all of them um, 
uh, met at the p place of the of the police also the ccc lawyers data protection officers journalists journalist groups and some and many parties so that's a rather broad movement against this law and the reason why so many people get together for this was of course personal ef uh, well personal effects on you and fear that were two two big factors so data protection so no one actually wants that the police can uh, uh, go, come through your data unrestrictedly. So uh, I don't have anything to hide is obviously mm, bullshit because you don't know maybe you have to hide something or want to hide something. And drugs, of course, haven't been that irrelevant for young people and for politically active people. Political freedom is very important, and so it says that you have to be, you want to be active without fear of political rep uh, repressions. Okay, so here you can see a picture of the mass of the people in Munich. What actually also unfortunately uh, a small part, but unfortunately a small part, but is but at least it was a point that you have a that, that people realize there's a structural racism against people, and this is something they synthesize, synthesized with and wanted to help them. So now in 2019, the protest well slowed down, at least in Bavaria and other uh, counties, it's still working, other countries of Germany. And that is it's just certain. Um, in Bavaria, we have the there's a commission f called by the by the Conservative Party, the CSU, and which looks at this this criticism by the movement. And this uh, commission actually now just looks at the practical implementation. They don't look at moral questions. And what is a very Frappant is that they, you don't have like people from civil society in there, or even you don't have affected people in this uh, in this commission. So they 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 don't they can't decide about that. It's just so very usual German interpretation of democracy. Um, and currently, you have ten uh, court cases against this whole thing. We will keep you updated, but this and also that is against the constitution. Uh, that this is this has to be taken back those changes um, also in the whole country of Germany other countries get new police laws in a very similar style and similar manner except for Thuringen and Bre Bremen uh, where there's no planned and there's no they, they didn't say that they are planning to do Mecklenburg-Vorpommern and Schleswig-Holstein and Hamburg, Saarland and Berlin and Sachsen-Anhalt are currently um, thinking about it. In Baden-Württemberg you actually have new police laws, but after the CDU there um, they made a new, actually new proposal and with more concrete proposals. I took one example out of it. Um, so from the so they want uh, warrantless uh, searches on big um, events for everyone. So now we have this PAC commission. Um, maybe you follow that, but uh, they they even if you can criticize a lot of them, they also criticize this commission also did a lot against PAC, and so you have a new round of discussion and uh, there will be a new pro law proposal um, uh, let's see they 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 will uh, put s remove some things of those laws so what what is now our aim or our goal when we we what we actually want is that we can really abolish this kind of uh, law and as a movement or as a co an alliance uh, we see that it's not it's not enough just to have these two reforms of the police law being put away so this was this was just like the the last moment we actually should uh, we could have protested much much earlier and because f also the first reform of this law that, that we had just 35 people uh, again uh, protesting against this law in Munich so what I now want to do is that I talk a bit about the bigger context of society and tell you the political dimension of this and make you realize how important this is. 
what these reform of police laws that we experience right now is a symptom for and what this means if you look at the whole society and our idea of security. Now, the state of things is this. Germany, at least from the point of view of the authorities and their kinds of categories, is as safe as it never was. This is the police crime statistics here, where you can quite easily see that Germany is as safe it, as it never was since 1992 and the numbers of terror victims and uh, worldwide and especially in Europe is declining and of course the stepping up of these police laws is of course always justified with a presumed terror threat or threat of crime and the question we have to ask therefore is why does a society or why does a society need uh, so a society that gets ever safer need ever stronger security laws and I think the this is not easy to explain I believe and I will now follow the thoughts of two scientists whom you know may know Tobias Dingenstein and Peer Stolle who have said that the only way to explain this is for economic, social and cultural transformation processes that have been taking place since the 1980s and uh, that these changes uh, have fundamentally changed our relationship to the term security and these transformational processes are once of a structural nature for one thing, uh, a certain validation and uh, and uh, internationalization of the work environment and of social situations and the privatization of state functions as well, such as care for the elderly. And also uh, there is a change of an ideological nature. We have uh, the rise of the neoliberalism and a shift to the right. And without going into the depths of those, uh, because there could be a whole separate talk about these, but I'm sure I've heard this in similar debates. The, this all led to a certain social disintegration, uh, something that has been called a status panic, the fear of every individual to lose their own individual status and uh, sink beneath that status somehow. And this, what these authors call an existential fear, is always there, always present, and that is a permanent leads to a permanent insecurity, a feeling of permanent insecurity. And the result is that there is a shift in discourse around social control and the question how security can be safeguarded, <laughs> can be produced in a society. And it's more and more about how we individually can assume to be safe. Our own individual security is, has become the focus and we try more and more to limit or to delineate ourselves from with, with our own status and our own security from that that could threaten all this. And the aim of all that social control is to gain a completely new understanding of security and a concept of total security for the individual, which of course can never be reached. To put it very bluntly, life is dangerous. As long as you're not dead, you're not safe. And that of course has the consequence that the whole state practice of social control has shifted. Initially, which I've tried to depict here, it was more about concrete social conflicts and threats and violations of rights or of things that rights should protect. So police, for example, would come and see what has happened and investigate. So that in cases of suspicion of individual concrete crimes. But with this new sense of security, we more and more try to anticipate risks and regulate them. 
And that, in turn, leads to the fact, and I believe the new police laws are a good example of this, leads to a situation where more and more we want to investigate ahead of crime before a crime has actually occurred and try to anticipate where the crime could take place, where is there a risk. And clearly, a risk, what is risk? It's nothing but a statistical probability. It's not something you can touch. So to determine risk, in some way or other, you have to categorize the world into what is dangerous and what is not dangerous. And that isn't just a time shift. It is also, according to Singerstein and Stolle, a completely new way of looking at the situation of threat. And of course, this categorization into potentially dangerous and not dangerous, it doesn't happen completely disconnected from, from anything else. It is influenced by people, algorithms, you know much more about this than I do, I'm sure. But in this categorization of the world into risks and non-risks, all kinds of prejudice, racism, discrimination that we as a society have play a role and this gets transported into this concept. And in addition to that, we have a fatal link between three new developments and this is once the structural, the erosion of the limits of police work, state control, new security laws, they can suddenly are suddenly allowed to investigate ahead of the crime, they have new means, then there is an extension of power, which is not only existent in the state of North Rhine-Westphalia, where the police suddenly are allowed to use tasers against potential and dangerous, but also an ever stronger state control. In the last decades, this has fundamentally changed or strongly changed. What we see as police responsibilities or state control, such as alcoholism, is now much more regarded as an object of state control or has become an object of state control. To be confronted with poverty in the public space is more and more dealt with by security authorities and police forces. And again, you know more about this than I do. Uh, in this context, we have technological opportunities, technological tools that we haven't had in the past. And of course, this risk logic leads when you find when you want to find all kinds of risks and want to live in total security this leads to ever new risks being discovered or having to be discovered and this discovery of risk leads to new risks being produced and the best way to discover these is to have an, a, a data set that is as large as possible and that of course leads to a, an insatiable thirst for data that the state control institutions have and in the worst case it leads to surveillance without cause with very vague preconditions for intervention such as the threat of some kind of danger. Nobody knows what the criteria really are and uh, it has to be stressed again and again this can lead to intervention against people that have not committed a crime but against people who the state and the police assume that they potentially could be co uh, commit a crime, for example, based on their political convictions, their intentions, their place, their location, their, lo their skin color, their religion. Now, the arbitrariness of this uh, is going to be shown by my other speaker, my co-speaker, but we have an extension of surveillance potential that from the democratic point of view can no longer be regulated. And here is an article in Neues Deutschland by Rolf Gössner, uh, which I think summarizes it very well. That was a review of the last year in police laws, which I can very much recommend. And he writes that with the preventive shift of police tasks and secret authorizations far into the uh, area of uh, suspicion, 
or a possible a danger, the relationship between the citizen and the state is reversed. The presumption of innocence, one of the most important uh, achievements of the rule of law, loses its limiting function. The human becomes a potential security risk, uh, potential security risk who has ultimately has to prove uh, his harmlessness or her innocence. Now we'll come to some practical examples. And firstly, police raids. Okay. You see here a lot of police raids data. They happened in refugee homes in Bavaria in 2018. There is near, near 2,000 uh, identity convictions. And I'll get pe back to that later through the law of integration. And I'm going to talk about how this plays out in practice. When the police enters a place, they go into every single room. And the inner ministry defines it at entrance as an enter and they raid they look underneath furniture they look everywhere inside the home the inner ministry stated officially that an entry is defined as that the police can actually really look at everything in this in this flat or, or room so they have no uh, regulations or, or borders where to look at these raids usually happen at 5 or 6 a.m. in the morning it doesn't matter if it's a family home or no uh, just imagine having to tell your children uh, why there is a man with a gun in the room all of a sudden in the morning and everyone has to get up and show their papers and what a suffering and anxiety that would induce and you can all imagine that and it's also not just 10 police police guys from the village no it's a police force of a hundred men um, there is more forces being used, more complex forces, not just two or three guys. And just imagine an adult person who's been a refugee and who's been on his way a long time, and he's in his home, and then he's exposed to a situation like that. And like I could imagine personally that that would really suck. And uh, unfortunately, I'm the wrong person to uh, to analyze this, but it would be very interesting to ask these people about how, how that felt. And there is very confusing um, Anzeige? Anzeige? Reports. reports, confusing reports result from that. So a uh, grandmother was uh, reported because she slept with the, at the place where her children was, but she wasn't uh, like registered there. So the only reason was she overslept at the place of her grandchildren. That's it. And the article that makes this possible, we're going to show it here, is Article 2333 of Integration Law. You can You can enter any flat at any time if it if you do it for the purpose of finding um, people who are seeking asyl asylum seekers they can arbitrarily enter every home with the suspicion of finding asylum seekers. And that is not against the Constitution. Uh, there is protest from people who, the, the protest from people who grew up here is seldom. 
or not that broad. So here uh, there's been a protest of some yeah. Sorry. Okay. Um, so they are they have been by the refugees they made uh, so the police said that the refugees were aggressive um, but the um, uh, civil people watching it said there were no um, there was nothing no violence but the the fire alarm was uh, raised and then of course people started running away um, and then two hours later, the police came with uh, like uh, f water throwers and pepper spray and uh, tear gas and of course real guns um, and looking for someone. And so then the refugees did a lot, like a press conference. They wanted to talk. They wanted talks. And the minister of interior actually came, but he didn't talk to the refugees, but just with the security. Um, and so then they in increased security um, in this uh, refugee home. Interesting uh, interpretation of uh, democracy. Um, also in Schweinfurt, uh, where the police said you had a lot of um, uh, well riots. I mean, w what do you mean by riots? I wouldn't be very calm if you just have uh, at 5 a.m. a group of police people coming into my home and just uh, uh, removing people from my home the, the, and then they put 10 to so that was the first case where they used this uh, preventative uh, arrest so they just put 10 or to 11 people f they jailed them for three weeks without a lawyer so they were not allowed to, to contact a lawyer and there was no there was no uh, decision by a judge um, but and this law this police law says that there hasn't they, they don't need a lawyer which happens to refugees and of course refugees usually don't have a very uh, good picture of uh, the German law um, so what kind of uh, rule of law is this if we if we uh, take the law away from such uh, very weak minorities um, and, and so and also you had this in another so the first in the first uh, arrestments in other German countries were used against uh, environment activists so they couldn't because they couldn't uh, get the identity of those people uh, when they protested and so then they just put them uh, five days into jail which is clearly uh, aimed at protest so maybe uh, climate justice will just uh, will just fail because of new police laws uh, because people will be afraid of going to jail um, and this is also strongly against political activists and it is used to reduce their numbers, so to make those movements shrink. So this is used, um, as, and this is just power abuse, to um, because usually activists go to lawyers um, to to have uh, to to get uh, advice, but now they can't do this because lawyers can't actually tell you what is possible to happen because those new laws give such broad powers to the police. Now we have a closer uh, example which is Leipzig. So there's a weapon prohibition zone in Leipzig. What is a weapon prohibition zone? This is uh, where everyone can be searched by the police. Uh, um, okay, so weapon. Pr and so here the police explains what you're not allowed to have in the weapon prohibition zone. No, no, no of course, no kinds of knives, sprays, axes, but also not like you can't have. And the, the, it says at the bottom, it says, and other things. Which means, th th so be be careful if you go home tonight. You don't, you shouldn't have other things with you. Um, and that's yeah. incredibly ridiculous. Sorry. Wow. Uh, comment from Richard Slater. So now we have four theses here. So how can we uh, how can we make a critique uh, on this security, so-called security? mania um, to to make to, to, to how can we create a critique for this that is really deep 
embedded into society. Um, this was so for example last year the police the police talked more about incre even increasing more of this and uh, modeling p federal police law on the w on the law in Bavaria so for us the big question is uh, how can we continue so we have this PAC commission we talked about now it's a regulation from the police law um, I think that there will be some like uh, pseudo corrections and pseudo am amendments but this like uh, possible danger everyone can be uh, can be uh, well put in can be the police can can have suspicion about anyone and can arrest anyone so this will rise I think in 2018 this was discussed much more about this law this police laws but in 2019 that went back somehow but it's not just those police laws you know so we, there was a lot of discussion about uh, this law against hate speech and hate criminality and what what was supposed there was proposed there is actually very similar to those uh, laws um which have very difficult or like uh, not very useful or very dangerous uh, things how they can uh, how dangerous they are for for people and are for our freedoms and they're very dangerous for democracy and now just for summing up i have four theses um, what we can do and which we can use as a basis for discussion what will be needed now. The first thing is we need an immediate moratorium for all kinds of uh, changes to our security laws, all, all kinds of reforms. I think that as a society we are not um, able to to uh, get an overview in which kind of situation we actually currently are. So this is something we should get very... Um, we should really know and get very aware of. So that we have a reprioritization of what we think. So, yeah, but the first thing is, well, people say, yeah, but you as an anti-fascist, you want that the police, uh, well, that they hunt down right extremists, and so for that they need their means, and they need laws, and they need powers. And I'd say, well, if the state would uh, just uh, t uh, well uh, annoying just small cri people who are who do hacking who take marijuana and if they would stop uh, well putting a lot of effort in those people they would have enough power and people uh, the second thing the call for a in total, uh, I believe that we urgently need to become aware in some form and we have to obtain the information to what extent we are actually being surveilled and what happens to our data. And in our experience, uh, this really, this, this fear of surveillance of one's own data is truly a reason why so many civil forces went out on the streets onto the streets with us we believe that a total account of surveillance laws could politicize civil society on a wider scale and turn them against the authoritarian police laws my third thesis is that anti-racism training should become obligatory for us all uh, it has been touched upon, but we very much perceive that these laws are mostly mostly have the nature of extremely racist laws. In 85% of cases, these measures are targeted against migrants, people with migration background, categories that somehow are linked to these people and that m turn them into so-called endangerous. And I believe that we all uh, need a better view uh, um, to exercise solidarity with these people and be aware what actually might threaten to come to all of us and that we should deal with racism and the last item 
that not only when it comes to climate change, there are so-called tipping points that are threatening, things that are irre irreversible, that things that can accelerate so much that they can never be turned back. And in our opinion, the stepping up of the laws that are currently taking place are so drastic that it will take decades to reverse them. And we believe, we, we fear that we will reach a point where we will, we will not be able to do this anymore. And this is, of course, one thing that Katasha has kept pointing out. We have to imagine what will happen with these laws if the fascists really should come at some point and should be sitting in government in Berlin. So we don't just believe, it's not just because it's good to raise a sort of so-called productive panic. We need a interior politics that is suitable for our grandchildren, not just a climate politics that is suitable for our grandchildren, a politics that enables them to reverse the erosion of rights that is taking place now. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for this amazing deep dive into the history of uh, the story. We have quite some time left for, to for questions, so please line up behind the microphones in the room and be ready, be, be uh, courageous to ask these questions. Does the signal angel have a question from the internet? Yes, I have three questions from the internet. Start with one, please. Uh, are there any recommendations what can be done to uh, have these laws harden ever more, st <laughs> st stepped up ever, ever more? Well, yes, demonstrate, organize, uh, organize within your, with your friends, talk about the issues, spread the information. Yeah. Protests, protest against this. And yes, I believe that massive public protest, um, the protest against the Bavarian law made the CSU in Bavaria stumble. It was a disaster that so many people went out on the streets. And that wasn't the only demonstration that there was. So, surely, can I add, talk with politicians? These are people too. So we should talk to them. Number three, please. Hello. Maybe you saw the talk about Hong Kong, the protest there. Um, if not, you definitely watch it because it's super interesting. It's about the five demands that are appearing in the protests in Hong Kong, which I find very interesting, which we should also establish in Germany. So two central demands appear in Hong Kong. One independent um, place that is educating about police violence, which we also should have in Germany. But the second thing I find more important, namely that protests do not declare it at, do not get declared as riots, so that the language about it will change. One example would be. Um, Doru at G20 kept saying, yeah, so the, the, the pro well, the rioters, the rioters, which actually he meant the protesters. Did you ever think about adopting these protest cultures? Because that's much broader than just focusing on police issues. Yeah, well, fundamentally, yes. And you have to be honest and say, well, particularly with these movements against police laws in Germany, we've reached a point where we are quite struggling to get networking within Germany, right? And this is about the resources. Uh, you know how it is with these movements. If you have 10 people uh, running a large-scale rally, uh, you know, that's th what the case is like in Germany too. We are struggling and it is the case that we are trying to gain an insight into European states of affairs, but also around the world and keep an over... So keep, keep a kind of record. And But yes, but thanks for that hint. 
I'm sure that we would love to watch this and we would be able to learn from that. Yeah. Thanks for the talk in any way. One aspect that interests me would be in the beginning in the presentation you said that in the statistics that oh that the statistics is actually decreasing. Aspect that interests me would be during these laws, is it um, the police that demands, is it from the police side or from the politics side? It is mostly the politics. There are some voices from police, but it's the politics that really have uh, the influence um, and it has to be said, some police people uh, are listening to politics and they are more positively suited, or in inclined, and they, seem that they may see a potential advantage for them. And in my opinion, it depends very strongly on the individual location. I know that there are cities where the police presidents are very, very interested in this pre-cop thing. Uh, what is it? Uh, well, the interpreter knows predictive policing. <laughs> These are, oh, the computer programs uh, where you can somewhat uh, feed the data in and try to evaluate who is in danger and who is not. and. Uh, what are the dangerous places in, in a city, uh, things like that. You know what I'm talking about. And uh, some really are in love with this, and this sometimes is something that a single person is striving for. And on the other hand, it depends on the police culture. And I think police culture and the whole dynamic within the police force is a very different topic that maybe is strongly linked to all this and the question of police violence as well. But we have tried to look at these structural issues uh, because the other questions could fill another whole evening again. More questions from the internet? Next question. Genau. Um, gibt es denn realistische Hoffnungen, dass die PAGs in absehbarer Zeit wieder entschärft werden? Is there realistic hopes that the PRGs are going to be disarmed in the near future and how can this be supported by individuals? PRG meaning police laws, that's just the abbreviation used in one state. Yes, there are alliances in every state against the police laws and that is where all the organizations come together that are against these laws and that's why you can look at the individual NGOs and see which of those suits you and yes I would say that no matter where you are located politically whether you're on the left uh, where on the left you are you will find an organization that is active and then uh, that some, wor uh, some work with police, then, are the, then there are the alliances themselves that can take donations. And another option would be to look who is running a legal complaint against these cases, because these are important things as well, and they, they need support and money as well. Thank you very much indeed. Another question from microphone four. Hello. It's trendy right now that many state actions are um, passed on to other actors uh, like security um, companies or other companies and so to basically walk around the law with that loophole. So you mean privatization of security? Yeah. Well, yeah. I am not an expert on this, I have to admit, but it is a huge topic that more and more security tasks are privatized by cities, for example, and that these security companies cannot be controlled anymore. I think that is the only thing I can say about it right now. Yeah, well, the refugees that I talked about from the city of Donauwörth in Bavaria have had have experienced a lot of 
uh, violence from the security companies and of course that the problem here is that it's often one statement against the other and I can confirm that many of these security companies have clearly exceeded limits and violated boundaries when it comes to violence but it's always difficult because it's one statement against the other and these the affected people have far fewer, far less rights than the police forces. On to microphone number one. I remember the Bavarian um, law about psychiatry, which was very special in its own rights. Um, it came to a... They made it less strict, but how, how come that worked for that law and not for the police law? Well, we did have a long debate in the Alliance at the time. Uh, the law that you just mentioned, yes, that is such a stupid thing. They, they realized it quickly, I think, and many psychologists, people in psychiatric institutions working there, said that is just impossible. You cannot take people that are depressive and put them in prison. And there's, uh, there was a lot of nonsense involved there. And it wasn't the case, though, that, well, th this police law in Bavaria was the pride of the CSU, the governing Conservative Party. They wanted to really keep it and, and not give it up and not lose against that protest. And uh, the big treasure this was supposed to be, which they went into the election campaign with, so they were very tough. They even produced posters against our campaign. A true Bavarian will not go to these rallies and things like that. Thank you. I think we have one more question from the Signal Angel, correct? Uh, we have the privacy violations um, on the side of the... Uh, how, okay, how does it all go together? Well, you don't, re you don't really know, do you? Uh, not really, I'd say. It doesn't really go together. Uh, yeah, no, uh, it, it's, it, it, it can't be brought into agreement. And maybe the Constitutional Court in Bavaria will be of a different opinion, who knows. Microphone 4, please. Hello. How is it? You said that most, mostly this is targeted against refugees, but are there examples where maybe this... Uh, law was targeted against people from the midsection of society so that I could maybe use this to explain it to my neighbor. Well, the thing is we don't really know, do we? The one thing that we do know, uh, for example, the use of the arrests or detention for endangerous, that is something we know through a parliamentary commission because in the case of in the course of the evaluation of this law this commission was given all cases by the government and it has to be said that uh, particularly the detention that many refugees experienced in Schweinfurt in Bavaria we didn't really he learn of this for uh, ages and it was very hard to get any insights and as an alliance we often through various journalists we, uh, we, from the Bavarian state broadcaster, the public broadcaster, we talked to them, we tried to get in touch with the uh, people that were being detained and it wasn't possible and they were disappearing in, in a kind of hole without a lawyer. Uh, so this is a very special case, but in, uh, generally we don't really know a lot and it has to be said, it hasn't been enforced for such a long time. I can say that we are trying as an alliance to collect all these cases, the ones that we hear about, and I would recommend to you to read up. Uh, there was an article in Tageszeitung, the left daily newspaper, uh, about a man that was uh, regarded a left extremist endangerer, and a journalist ac uh, accompanied this man through his everyday life and reported what this really meant, the fear of getting in touch with people in his social uh, environment, the fear of, of bringing them into the surveillance that he experienced. And this is a really recommended thing to read. And it was very impressive. It, it, it showed very impressively what it means if someone gets into 
the focus of these measures. And I would like to add very shortly, the thing is, why is it like this? Why is the center of society not affected at mu that much? And that is what I was talking about. It's about empathy. It takes empathy. It takes listening to people that are affected by depression. It has been the case like th th in, in every day. And uh, the center of society, from the point of view of a police person, is a well-suited German person not affected. I know so many middle-aged white people that have never been checked by police. I'm quite young, as you can see. I've had dozens of checks. So that relationship is very uh, unbalanced, and uh, that is something to keep in mind. Thanks a lot. Microphone number two. You said in the beginning that last year the the wave of protest decreased a little bit. Do you know of any future protest or actions, um, or do you know any explanation why it decreased? Or do you think that there is going to be more once it gets discussed again publicly? Or if there is going to be a public decision about it? Well, it's the case with many things that public debate uh, and, and the numbers behind it are important. Uh, we've had a demonstration a short time ago in Hamburg. It is the case that in other federal German states, the debate is currently kicking off. About two weeks ago, there was a rally in, I forgot the place, and uh, it depends on how many people organize events and actions. Many people say, okay, it's the current issue, and the issue that gets people to do a lot of ac uh, action and the reason, the motivation is to get a broad reach and the way to get that broad reach is the press, the media and they care about what is currently going on and there were state elections as well, you have to keep in mind. And uh, we are still working the alliance against the Bavarian police law and what we have planned. There is the European Police Congress every year in Berlin and we'd like to have a counter congress and think about it in a different way and ask what we imagine a secure and good society to be. And that is what we are planning right now. And uh, in Munich at the moment on another level there is the ZECO, the security conference. There will be a rally there that, uh, that's being planned, and that is security in the exterior. But that is very much linked to this whole complex as well. And the question of boarding up the Fortress Europe, uh, which is, is again a kind of mania that expresses in expresses itself in the need for security. That's a whole other topic to enter into, but those are the next two things that are uh, outstanding. And in uh, many other German federal states, of course, we are in our own little bubble in Bavaria, which is a very s special kind of state, but uh, there was a uh, nationwide rally against stepping up of security laws. These things take place all the time, and you can find that in social media. We have a website as well where you can find this information and the other organizations have it too. And we have a very active team uh, with uh, data protection people there as well who are uh, dealing with this topic of a total account of surveillance laws. Many, many thanks for this very profound answer. We have one more question from the signal angel, correct? And one question, well, let's start with that one. In France, there was 2006 the ZPE law, where they demonstrated for days to to um, to have it not allowed. Do, is it possible that maybe we just need longer demonstrations? Well, look at Fridays for Future. It doesn't it doesn't necessarily work. It does depend on politics and the form of protest as well. Yes, so the longer, the more pressure there will be, surely. The more people, the more pressure as well. So that can help too. Right, microphone number four. Thank you very much for the presentation and also for your very consequent work, for your straight work. 
of a comment on your thesis. So I think if you want more education on racism and f for human rights and you try to you try to attack these racist laws, it leads um, and you, you take a moral stance um, uh, because these people are our they're our allies. So yeah, so in Frank France there are demonstrations right now. There are protests and strikes. Strikes, yes, many strikes. So my question would be: Why is there not more political discourse about the strikes um, against these conditions? Well, I do find it a bit difficult to make recommendations regarding racism. Yes, uh, that sh we should mention that, but we can talk about various approaches. Uh, a subject of anti-racism in school would have a fantastic effect. It would be very necessary. And we can talk about different approaches, of course. And strikes, what do you think? Well, we were in Munich, uh, we were in Alliance uh, when we organized the rally, the demo, and yes, of course, you can talk about various forms of protest, but the question is, at this point in time, a rally, a large rally, was what really brought these actors together onto the s uh, at to the same table. And uh, you can, of course, debate whether that was good to have all these groups there or not. But at that time, it was quite successful, right? And that was the form that we found at the time and what we had the capacity for. And you may remember that we all tried to uh, have a youth action, uh, the, uh, an education about uh, deportation. And uh, it has to be said, the power that we... the put in there didn't quite have an effect and maybe yes strikes may have to be established my personal opinion but it is difficult it's more difficult than going out onto the streets on a sunday right let's go to the very last question we are out of time a bit so please be short microphone five my question is about the concepts of surveillance <laughs> Could you explain that concept? Ah, well, you said some. You opened opened the Pandora's box there. Can you talk about that? Yes, I can. Oh, that's great. Very, very, very nice. The total account of surveillance laws is something that the German Constitutional Court around 2013 used in the reasoning in a judgment against data retention and this was uh, elaborated in other commentaries on court judgments and individual votes of judges that were against this judgment and uh, the and it puts the obligation on the interior ministry to have this kind of total account for the case that data retention should be introduced. Uh, that's telecommunications data retention. That doesn't mean that it has to be introduced if other security laws are being introduced, just if telecommunications data retention would be reintroduced. For myself, that is not enough. The commentaries and individual um, votes of the other judges were of a very clear opinion, saying that it should take place anyway. So, uh, much more, many more than 30 individual legislations since that judgment should be evaluated in detail to verify, and that is what the court mandated, whether they cause chilling effects in society and deter from the free exercise of someone's fundamental rights. We won't be as lucky as that to have this kind of a qualified answer. Thank you very much. And a huge applause to our two speakers. And I hope you've liked the translation you've been listening to.